Scar, you will be in continuation. We'll move to questions without notice. Senator Sheldon, if he's Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Anne is uh, an aged care nurse who has been in her profession since 1978. She has said, and I quote, the proposed legislation doesn't make things better for us and our residents. It makes it so much worse. And to be honest, I don't think I can handle any more cuts. Can the minister guarantee Mr Morrison's industrial changes won't see workers paid less? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank the senator for his question. Uh, I can absolutely guarantee that the industrial relations reforms our government proposes, alongside indeed all of the measures our government is proposing, are about ensuring that Australians have access to more jobs, to more job opportunities, to be able to work in an economy that is growing faster, more strongly, in creating those jobs, creating and putting pressure on wages over time to drive wages growth too, and that indeed what we want for Anne or for any employee across Australia is to have more opportunity overall, Mr President, to have more opportunity overall. And so our determination through this passage, having spent many hours, many hours engaging with the union movement, engaging with employer organisations, is to try to find efficiencies within the operation of the industrial relations system Order. such that there can be Far greater confidence, far greater confidence for employers to grow their businesses, to hire more people, to create more opportunities, because that is precisely what we have been driving at as a government. And as we've worked through this pandemic period, we've been able to save, according to the Reserve Bank, some 700,000 jobs saved as a result of some of the direct policy actions of the government. We've been able to bring back more than 90 per cent of those employees who found that their hours went to zero or lost their jobs during the depths of the pandemic. We have been able to see around 800,000 jobs recreated, jobs growth over recent time, and pleasingly, very significant jobs growth among women. Because one of our greatest achievements prior to the pandemic was to see women's workforce rec participation reaching record levels, and it's fantastic to see it driving Order. back Senator to that Birmingham, point yet again. Time for the answers expired. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Karen has been a registered nurse for 12 years. She says losing her penalty rates under the coalition industrial relations changes, and, and I quote, will have an impact on my income and that of my colleagues. This will mean a drop in our standard of living and spending power. Why does the coalition government want to inflict pay cuts on our nurses in the middle of a pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, it's just not the case. It's not the case that there is any intention for those sorts of outcomes from the legislation that is before this parliament and upon which a committee will report in a few weeks' time Order. and which this chamber will have its opportunity at that stage to debate and to Order. pursue. But our intention is fully that there are more jobs, more job opportunities, and from that, from that, better Senator income security for Australians into the future. And we want to make sure, we want to make sure through this that there are the maximum incentives for new jobs to be created for Australians, be they on greenfield sites, for example, where there have long been concerns about the operation of the system. And what's distressing is that those opposite have decided to check themselves out of the debate completely in favour of a scare campaign. They've said we're voting against this bill, polis bolus. Even the parts that the trade union movement have argued for. They're not even going to vote for tougher penalties on wage theft. It's remarkable Order. to think that that Senator is the case. Senator Birmingham, time for the answers expired. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Aged care nurse Belinda has pleaded, and I quote, it is already so hard for us. Please do not make things harder. Why is Mr Morrison and his government ignoring the pleas of workers like Belinda and instead choosing to suppress wage growth and exaggerating insecure working conditions in the middle of a global pandemic. Senator Birmingham. 
Mr President, a better question would be why is Senator Ciccone and the Labor Party so intent on trying to scare people with falsehoods, with lies, with mistruths? Why is it, Mr Order. President, why is it, Mr. President that those opposite have checked themselves out of Order any sort of rational left. policy debate and instead Senator they Wong. just want to try to Senator run another Keneally. scare campaign? Well, on this side of, in this Order. side of Parliament, we are about trying to get things done that create more jobs. And our government succeeded. Senator Watt. Through our first six years, Senator Watt, we created one and a half million more jobs for Australians. Order. One Senator and a half Birmingham. million more jobs. Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. I doubt anyone in the chamber can hear me with my open microphone. There was so much noise. I'm going to ask for some restraint. Well, I couldn't hear him either, Senator Farrell. There were too many interjections. Senator Birmingham. I'm pleased Senator Farrell could hear me because I was talking about the more than one and a half million additional jobs created through the first six years of our term in government. Workforce participation hitting record levels. Women's workforce participation hitting record levels. We want to make sure that we get back to that point post-pandemic. The only Senator thing in our way is you lot. Time for the answers expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister inform the Senate of the government's plans to roll out the COVID-19 vaccine into aged care facilities across the country? The Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Van, for the question, an important one, especially given the Prime Minister and the Health Minister have just advised of the TGA's provisional regulatory approval of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is, of course, central to our vaccine strategy. Mr President, rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine to our frontline health care quarantine workers and our most vulnerable is the highest priority of the government. We saw the first delivery of Pfizer vaccines touch down in Sydney yesterday, and we are working to have those vaccines distributed to those priority groups across the country. Vaccination for residents and staff will be made available through residential aged care facilities where they live or work. The, vaccina the vaccine in implementation plan for residential aged care plans aims to administer doses to more than 240 aged care facilities in the first week. Vaccin vaccines will be delivered by Commonwealth-led teams. Mr. President. Healthcare Australia will provide vaccination workforce in New South Wales and Queensland, and Aspen Medical will res be responsible for the other states and territories. The vaccination program will be supported at local levels by the primary health networks, and everybody Mr. President, responsible for providing vaccine, uh, the vaccine in aged care settings will be required to have completed the relevant tr training, including the use of multi-use uh, multi-dose multi vials, cold storage and, of course, infection control. In the coming weeks, Mr President, the vaccination program will reach more than 2,600 res residential aged care facilities, more than 183,000 residents and 339,000 staff. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on how the government is supporting providers, residents and their families for the vaccine rollout. Senator Colbeck. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. An important question. Information has been sent out, Mr. President, to aged care facilities for residents and their families, carers and loved ones about what to expect in the lead up to and on vaccination day. Our clinical workforce will work very closely with each facility in the lead up to vaccination day to plan and to make sure each vaccination day runs safely and efficiently. Each residential aged care facility will ask residents and their substitute or their substitute decision maker if one is in place to consent to receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. Clinical staff at facilities will check the health of residents prior to administering the vaccine, and if families have any concerns about the health of residents, they should consult a GP. As always, safety, safety, safety is uppermost in our minds as we embark on our vaccination program across the country. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister also update the Senate on the phased national rollout of the COVID-19 vaccine? Senator Colbeck. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, COVID-19 risks the lives of the most vulnerable in our society. We have prioritised the, those most at risk, our senior Australians and our frontline workers. They will be part of phase 1A. It is on track, as planned, to roll out next week. Phase 1B will include adults aged over 70 years and over, other healthcare workers, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people over 55, younger adults with an underlying medical condition, including those with a disability, critical high-risk workers, including defence, police, fire, emergency services and meat processing workers. Phase 2A Mr. President, includes adults aged 50 to 69 years, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people aged 18 to 54 years and other critical and high-risk workers. Phase 2B Mr. President, extends to the remainder of the population uh, within Australia over the age of 16. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Yesterday, the Minister stated that the grant to the National Retailers Association was made, and I quote, in response to that terrible terrorist attack in Melbourne. Does the Minister stand by this statement? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, yes, I do. And I'll reiterate the advice that I received yesterday. So, uh, the National Retail Association, as I noted yesterday, does donate to both sides of politics. But I did also note that there was the Burke Street terror attack on the 9th of November. Uh, on the 9th of November 2018, one male attacker, whose name I won't mention, set his car on fire and stabbed three people and attacked police in Melbourne. Of those three stabbing victims, as we all know, one was a much beloved Melbourne identity, uh, Sisto Malaspina. A retailer of the type, of which the National Retailers Association provides advocacy for. Later the same month, on the 20th of November, three men inspired by the Islamic State terror group were arrested on suspicion of plotting a terror attack in Melbourne. They had tried to source a semi-automatic rifle to kill as many people as possible in a crowded space, police will allege. The National Retailers Association applied for funding for a Protecting, protecting Crowded Places project to assist retailers to deter, detect, delay and respond to a terrorist attack. Now, noting the significant events affecting the public and retailers over the months of November 2018, uh, the Minister for Home Affairs Office asked the Department of Home Affairs to consider this proposal. And, I've, and he has asked also, and he asked the Department of Finance uh, to cost it to ensure it was suitable and it was value for money. Uh, the proposal was subsequently assessed and recommended to be funded as it represented value for money and a proper use of Commonwealth resources, consistent with the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. I thank the minister for that answer. Documents released under Freedom of Information show that on 28 September 2018, almost two months before the Burke Street attack, Minister Dutton directed his department to consider a proposal for a grant to the National Retailers Association for protecting public spaces. How could the minister request his department to consider a grant in response to a terrorist attack that had not yet occurred? Senator Reynolds. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. And Senator Keneally, I think you have completely misunderstood, so I might go, I'll go back over the answer I've just given. Order. It, I'll just give you know, Order. So, this is, all, this is all about the politics of this issue, and this is really, this is really not a grant or a grant program to take, uh, to take that out. So again, this grant was for the type, for the type of these activities. The National Retailers Association who represents left. businesses like those who were impacted by that terrible attack, seeking for crowded place protection. That is exactly Senators at the heart Keneally. of what this grant was all about. Senator Scar, Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. Public documents reveal the minister received a direct political donation from the National Retailers Association a week before he asked his department to fast track a nearly million dollar grant. The Burke Street terrorist attack was a national tragedy. It saw one victim lose his life and two stabbing victims seriously injured. Is the minister really using this tragedy to cover up his conflict of interest? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And there is only one side of politics in this chamber who is playing politics with this issue. It was very clear that this was funding for protecting crowded places. 
which is exactly what Order. you said, what Senator Keneally said. Senator Keneally. It was vetted by finance, it was vetted by the Home Affairs, Order. and this was to protect retailers from terrorist attacks. It is that simple, and there is only one side who is playing politics with that, and that is that side of the chamber. Order. I'm going to ask senators to recall my— re Senator Keneally, Senator Keneally, while I'm talking, please, I'm going to ask people to respect my request that when they're called by name to at least count to ten slowly before they start breaching standing orders again. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. I refer to Brittany Higgins's allegations of rape in this building almost two years ago. I asked you yesterday whether the Sex Discrimination Commissioner would be tasked with a culture review of parliament, but you didn't answer me. The Prime Minister this morning announced that a Liberal MP will undertake a culture review and that the Deputy Secretary of PMNC will undertake a review of the handling of Brittany's complaint. Given the secrecy with which previous reviews have been undertaken by PMNC, will the Prime Minister guarantee that the findings of these reviews will be made public? And how can women have confidence that change will flow from two internal reviews when the culture of silencing is part of the problem? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Waters for her question. It's essential uh, in matters such as this that uh, the support provided to uh, employees uh, members of parliament uh, or any other uh, individual in this building uh, is support that uh, is timely, uh, is effective and uh, is ongoing or enduring wherever necessary. Uh, it's important that in ensuring that we can provide such support to individuals, everyone has confidence in the processes and support and systems that are available to them. And that's why the Prime Minister has asked in particular the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet to assist and advise on how those processes uh, can work to support people. It is my full expectation uh, that in relation to the conduct of that work, uh, Ms Foster, the Deputy Secretary, uh, will engage with Kay Jenkins, the Sexual Discrimination Commissioner and author of the Respect at Work report. I also note that in the other place, uh, the Prime Minister has indicated a willingness uh, and openness to working with party leaders uh, across the parliament uh, in relation to how these processes can be strengthened, uh, including the type of work uh, that Ms Foster will undertake uh, and any additional assistance or work alongside her that will be necessary. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Uh, noting the Prime Minister's previous empathy training, will the Prime Minister now undertake training to become aware of the victim blaming implicit in his statement about Brittany, quote, being found in a vulnerable situation, end quote, as opposed to men's bad behaviour causing that situation, and training to understand the sexist underpinnings of his statement that he had to think of his daughters when thinking about how Brittany's rape case should have been handled? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, respect is crucial at all points of considering these matters, and ultimately, uh, respect in this particular case for Brittany, her wishes, and the support that she needs is the most important factor. The government, through different, uh, through the minister, as indicated, sought to provide a support for Brittany. It is with deep regret and deeply distressing that, despite those efforts, including Minister Reynolds facilitating discussions with the police and the offer of assistance through the Department of Finance, that that support was not adequate. And we have to address that and rectify those issues. That's what the processes that will be undertaken will seek to do to ensure that, whilst we will continue to offer whatever support to Brittany and to the police investigation, but also in the future, and we make sure that Order. staff can have greater Senator confidence Birmingham. in the support that Time is available to them and utilise it. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. This morning, the Prime Minister said that Brittany should be listened to. Will he listen to her call today for an independent body for staff to take complaints to? Senator Birmingham. Uh, Mr President, uh, I imagine that, uh, that uh, the robustness uh, of the Department of Finance procedures that are available at present uh, will absolutely be part of uh, investigations and discussions that ensue in relation to these matters. Uh, and where uh, gaps exist in terms of the confidence uh, that staff have in utilising those processes, we'll then 
options will be on the table to fill those gaps. And the government is not seeking to rule out uh, options in that regard. You know, the most important thing is that the support is there for individuals like Brittany to feel empowered to make the best decisions for them, to feel supported, empowered and respected through the decision-making processes uh, that they wish to make. And clearly, clearly, the systems need to be in place to support individuals feeling that way, and we want to make sure that the systems are enhanced to achieve that outcome. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Birmingham as the Minister representing the Treasurer. Last night, the ABC's Australian story rang a harrowing story about the dangers of button batteries. Last December, after many years of lobbying by advocates, including parents and paediatricians, the government introduced mandatory safety standards for button batteries, but these only come into effect in 18 months' time. In the ABC program, the deputy chair of the ACCC said, we need a general safety provision that makes it illegal to sell unsafe goods in Australia. At the moment, it is not illegal." End of quote. Minister, the government has been looking at the introduction of a general safety provision since 2015. Does the government agree that there must be a general safety provision that makes it illegal to sell unsafe goods in Australia? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Griff uh, for his question, and, uh, and I know his uh, advocacy on these issues. I note uh, his uh, moving in, uh, in November of last year a motion in the Senate related to button batteries and, uh, and also uh, the call for, to introduce a general product safety provision uh, in the Australian consumer law. Uh, the government uh, certainly takes seriously the safety of consumers. Uh, and on the 21st of December, as you acknowledge, the government announced new mandatory safety and information standards for button batteries and products that contain them to improve the safety of such products, including their design, packaging and labelling. Uh, there are indeed distressing stories in the past in relation uh, to such products, uh, and the government has sought to work uh, through the processes of consumer law, which include engagement with the states and territories uh, to be able to bring about uh, this ban and to provide heightened levels of protection. Uh, in relation to uh, general product safety provisions, certainly the government is, uh, is of a uh, strong view uh, that all actions to protect uh, consumers uh, wherever necessary from unsafe products ought to be taken. Uh, obviously, there are legal remedies and, uh, and expectations in the common law at present uh, that are available uh, and place expectations upon businesses in relation to uh, the safety of products that are offered uh, on the market. Uh, however, uh, in terms of specific consideration around uh, a general product safety provision, uh, I will uh, revert to, uh, to the uh, relevant ministers and uh, provide any further information that I can to, uh, to the Chamber, Senator Griff. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, Minister, you haven't clearly stated whether you intend to legislate. You reference that you will defer to the appropriate minister. So, should I take it that the government at this point does not agree that Australia needs to urgently legislate a general safety provision? I mean, it's five years down the track now and a number of very significant issues. It does appear that the government does not see this as an urgent matter. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, Senator Griff, uh, certainly product safety overall uh, is very important. Uh, a general product safety provision, uh, I imagine, uh, would come with a number of uh, different uh, complexities in relation to its drafting and interpretation. Uh, clearly, as I indicated before, there are processes in relation to consumer law matters uh, over which the states and territories uh, often have primacy and which are usually uh, developed uh, in consultation and through consensus and agreement uh, across the relevant ministerial councils there. I'm not uh, uh, briefed uh, today in terms of the detail and status of those particular discussions. Uh, that's why I undertook in the primary question to consult with relevant ministers, uh, and I will do that and bring whatever further information in relation to that more sweeping provision uh, back to the chamber for you. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, I appreciate that you'll bring that information uh, back to the chamber, but when you do that, do you personally see this as a priority and a priority that needs to be dealt with before parliament is uh, prorogued for the next election? 
Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, th thanks, Mr. President. Well, I certainly see the safety uh, of Australian consumers, and particularly young consumers, children, as a very uh, stark priority and an important one. Uh, it's important in terms of the work of this parliament that we make sure that the legislation we bring forward, when we bring it forward, is also effective in meeting uh, the objectives. Uh, there, is, uh, there is little point in terms of uh, generic provisions, bringing them forward uh, if they will simply uh, create uh, confusion but not effectively provide for the outcome, in this case the outcome of, uh, of safety. Uh, that's why working through, uh, particularly with the states and territories in relation to such consumer law protections is uh, the appropriate thing. It's also the necessary thing under our constitutional structures. Uh, I would hope that uh, if such provisions can be provided for that do give a significant enhancement to consumer safety, uh, that they would be brought forward as quickly as possible, Senator Griff. But uh, without having those, uh, those briefings and advice, I can't commit to Order. a timeline Senator to Senator today. Birmingham. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Reports indicate the alleged rapist's employment with the Minister's office ended on Tuesday, 26 March 2019. What was the reason for his employment ended, and did he resign or was he sacked? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank uh, the Senator for her question. Uh, I will answer the question, but if you would allow me just to address some of the matters that have been the subject of uh, a lot of media in the last 24 hours. Reflecting on the circumstances and reflecting on what I would say here in the chamber today, uh, saying sorry is often the hardest thing for those of us who work in this place to say. But can I say today, sorry is the easiest word for me to say. And I unreservedly apologise to Brittany Higgins. And last night we all heard from Brittany herself in her own words. Her trauma, her distress was very, very clear to all to see. The fact that she felt unsupported in her time working here was also very, very clear for us all to see. And for that, I apologise. At the time, I truly believed that I and my chief of staff were doing everything we could to support that young woman who I had responsibility for. At all times, my, my intent and my aim was to empower Brittany and let her determine the course of her own situation. Not by me, not by my staff, not by the government as a whole, but by Brittany. When I first met with her in my office about the matter, I was not aware of the details and circumstances of what occurred. However, I deeply, deeply regret conducting the meeting in my office where the alleged incident had occurred. It is now clear that this also has called ongoing distress to Brittany herself and compounded order. the trauma Senator, that she continues Senator to Reynolds, experience. Got, and Senator, for that, I, Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, Mr President, uh, what I would ask is uh, I would move that the minister be given an extension of time, because obviously she wishes to make this statement, but this is, we also would have given her leave to make this statement at any time. Uh, as she has said, she will want, uh, come to the uh, question. Uh, so I would propose by leave that she be given a further two minutes to come to the question when she's concluded this statement. I'll take it unless there's an objection that leave is granted. Please reset the clock. Senator Reynolds. Uh, look, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and thank you very much for, uh, to Penator, Senator Wong for that. Um, as I said, it was very clear to me uh, from seeing and hearing from Brittany on the TV last night that there was a range of circumstances which compounded her trauma and her grief. No woman should ever have to go through what she has clearly been through. That trauma, that trauma that comes not just in the immediate aftermath of an assault, but in the many months and the many long years that follow it, is what those of us in this building failed to acknowledge. However, listening uh, to Brittany describe the depression and the trauma she experienced in that subsequent time, it is very, very clear to me that more could and should have been done to support her. The kind of support Brittany needs has to start in a political office. 
It starts with her boss, in this case with me, with her colleagues, with her friends, but it cannot, it cannot end there. That is why I welcome the Prime Minister's announcement this morning that he intends to look at how we can improve the support mechanisms offered to staff and the processes around the handling of these most serious of workplace complaints. Um, as the inquiries uh, that the Prime Minister has announced and as the AFP investigation that was opened two years ago uh, continue, uh, I will work with them uh, in every way that I possibly can. Uh, Mr President, we have to do better and I'm sure we all want to do better. Uh, in relation to the question of my second staff member, um, he, he left my office shortly after that. I sought advice from Ministerial and Parliamentary Services, uh, who assisted me uh, through that process, and he was terminated from my Order, office. Senator Reynolds, time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. So I think the answer is that he was sacked. Is that correct? The alleged rapist has been described as the minister's favourite, a go-to person who had a special bond with the minister. Did the minister consider it odd that her favourite go-to person would resign on the spot uh, for a security breach without a conversation with her? Has the minister had any contact with the alleged offender since his, resi or since his termination? And if so, when? Senator Reynolds. Well, look, thank you very much, Mr. President. And the circumstances for both of my staff uh, will be subject of all of the ongoing investigations because they all relate to the same matter. Uh, all, what I can say, what I, what I can say, what I can say is, of course, I am responsible for my own conduct, and as every single person in this place is. In relation to uh, how I dealt with both of my staff. At all times, I sought advice from ministerial and parliamentary services who worked and assisted me right through this process in how to deal with both of my staff members. Now, the details and the circumstances of that uh, I don't think is fair for either party to air in this place today. However, there will be, I understand, the ongoing AFP investigation and order. the internal Senator, investigations what, Reynolds, where I, I believe Senator is the Wong right on place on to air those. Order. Senator, oh. Senator Wong on a point of order. We direct relevance. The question was asked whether or not the minister has had any contact with the alleged offender since his termination. I ask the minister to return to the question. Um, that, no, that, 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 I've allowed you to restate the last part of the question, Senator Wong. I, I do believe the minister is being directly relevant to an earlier part of the question. Um, there's a, an opportunity to debate these matters at an appropriate time. Senator Reynolds to continue. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, look, as I said, these were very complex matters. He left. Order. He left, Senator Reynolds, time he for left the my office has expired. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Order. Senator, Senator Gallagher is on her feet. Thank you. Order. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister inform the Senate why the uh, the alleged offender was terminated? And can you also inform the Senate whether the alleged rapist was assisted in finding employment following the alleged rape um, by herself or any other member of the government or your staff, uh, whether you provided a reference for that person. Senator Reynolds. Uh, sorry, Mr President. I'm somewhat bemused by the question. The person, the person was terminated by me with the assistance of ministerial and parliamentary services. I will take advice Order. on how much I can say about that person's termination, but he was, he was terminated very shortly after this incident, and I'll, I'll take on notice and seek some further advice about how much, Order. about how much I can actually say in relation to the circumstances Order. surrounding this, and I will come back to the chamber Order. when I've received that advice. Order. 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 Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. 
Could the minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's support for the construction industry through the COVID-19 pandemic has supported jobs, small businesses and kept apprentices in training and built the foundation for economic recovery? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, I thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question. And, uh, Mr President, the construction industry in Australia it is just fundamental to our economy. It employs now over 1.1 million Australians, and in terms of the number of small and family businesses within the construction industry itself, there are around 390,000 small businesses. This actually equates to roughly 98.5% of all businesses in the sector. Uh, and that is why the Morrison government has made supporting our construction industry a priority throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in terms of what we've actually done for the construction centre, one of the fundamentals was obviously keeping apprentices and trainees on the job where we need them. And of course, when you get hit with the pandemic, the apprentices and trainees are often the first to go, the first that an employer has to lay off. So we put in place a number of programs to assist our employers in keeping those apprentices and trainees on the tools, on the job, where we need them. They are, of course, the Home Builder Program, uh, support for our residential construction pipeline, uh, extending the first loan deposit scheme. Uh, but on top of they were combined. They were a number of policies: JobKeeper, the cash flow boost, the SME guarantee scheme. All of this, all of this, has helped minimise the economic impact on this vital sector. But as we emerge from COVID-19, the foundation these policies put in place is driving our early economic comeback. Over the last quarter of 2020, employment in the construction industry, Mr. President, has actually increased by two percent or 22,800 jobs. What we've also seen is more than 85,421 applications to the Home Builder Scheme. So what we're seeing is the policies that the Morrison government have put in place throughout the pandemic are assisting the construction industry to employ more people. Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Uh, thank the minister for that answer. How has the Morrison government supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy supported the future of the construction workforce through the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, according to the National Skills Commission, of the 1.1 million people that are employed in Australia by the construction industry, I'm pleased to say that over 50 per cent of them actually have a VET qualification, vocational education and training. In terms of the support that the government provided, we have our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy. This has been absolutely critical to keeping our apprentices and trainees on the job, as I said. To date, 119,500 apprentices and trainees employed by 62,600 employers have now been assisted, and that includes 59,000 small businesses. And in terms of the actual breakdown of those statistics, what we've seen is 22,500 bricklayers, carpenters and joiners, 17,200 electricians and 12,200 plumbers kept on the job because of the policies that the Morrison government put in place to assist these businesses in the construction industry. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. That's good news. Uh, how can the Morrison government's job maker plan support the future of the construction industry and ensure that it can continue to drive Australia's economic success into the future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the policies work together. So, in addition to the pipeline of work that we've secured through the Home Builder uh, policy, what we've also put in place is a boosting apprenticeship commencements policy. This is all about supporting the training of a new generation of apprentices. What we've seen to date in relation to that policy, over 88,000 new training contacts have been registered with the program to date, and that includes around 20,000 in the construction industry itself. So when you look at the suite of policies uh, that the Morrison government put in place in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, you've seen the business tax incentives that are out there helping businesses, uh, and in particular small businesses, the instant asset write-off, allowing businesses to invest in themselves, uh, but also to write off that new asset. Um, we're removing costly barriers for business. All of those policies combined have supported the construction industry to keep those apprentices and trainees in training on the job where we need Order. them. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, 
in the Senate, Mr. Minister Birmingham. On the 18th of June 2020, the Liberal Party, the National Party and the Labor Party supported a temporary order restricting each senator's ability to move a general business notice of motion. This rule change means that independent senators can move only one motion per week. When you and the Labor Party decided to team up to cut the number of motions that smaller parties were able to move, you argued it was because we were wasting too much of your time. In the six months since that temporary order, your government has spent 102 hours considering 111 bills. Over the same amount of time one year before, you spent 111 hours considering 136 bills. You spent less time on legislation after you gagged us than you did before you gagged us, and this is over the number of sitting weeks too. My question is, what are you doing with all that time you've saved? Order. The Leader of the Government, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I, can, I can say, as Leader of the Government in the Senate and having, uh, having also held Senator Rustin's role as Manager of Government Business in the Senate, that, uh, that it is indeed often one of the deep frustrations uh, for governments, and I suspect it was even the case during the years of Labor governments, that the finite amount of time that exists for government business to be considered in this chamber and government legislation to be considered can be eroded by all manner of different things. Certainly, the use of general business notice of motions had become a very substantial point of erosion in relation to the time that it took in the chamber. But indeed, the chamber provides for senators to do many things by leave, for senators to pursue suspensions of standing orders, for senators to use urgency motions and other things that all add up frequently to an erosion of the amount of time available to consider government legislation. So, Mr President, there are a number of factors I think at play in terms of the consideration of general business notices of motion, not the least of which being the concern felt that increasingly there was a complexity coming into those motions and that that complexity in motions that do not provide an opportunity for individual senators to debate the content of those motions uh, was a problem uh, and was not true and inconsistent with the original intent uh, of the way those motions were, con were uh, expected to be handled. So, uh, so, Mr. President, I think there are still, though, ample opportunities uh, for all senators, be they through the take note debate that will ensue shortly, the urgency motion that will happen this afternoon, the adjournment debate that will happen this evening, uh, the matters of public importance that happen at other times in the Senate schedule, or indeed in the debate of legislation itself, Order. for senators to Senator have their Birmingham. say. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. You've said the temporary gag order was needed to get rid of needless motions designed to make a political statement. On February the 4th, 10 coalition senators moved a motion noting that the Queen's been in power for 69 years. If I agree to only move motions asking the Senate to note the length of reign of foreign monarchs, can I please have my cap lifted? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, th th thanks Mr. President. Well, I, I do actually suspect, Senator Lambie, that if, uh, if the Senate had conducted the use of those motions in ways consistent with the original intent of them, uh, which was indeed that for motions to be put without any debate or opportunity for individual senators to make a contribution, they should ordinarily be motions that are largely non-controversial by their nature. That is indeed, if you go back through the past practice of this chamber, what the original intent of that process was. So, yes, Senator Lambie, if senators had, uh, had simply done that throughout history, we probably would never have got to the point uh, that the procedure committee in the chamber got to in relation to the consideration of this. But there are probably many other points of congratulations and noting uh, that could have been achieved without us reaching that point where the chamber made the decision that it did in relation to the management of motions. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I've spoken to Senator Patrick, and I know that he has made representations and asked for a reconsideration of this unfair rule change, to which you have provided no response. Do you think you could use some of that time you've saved to actually get back to him? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, uh, the Senate 
still sits the same hours per day, and, uh, and indeed my time is, uh, is often used in a range of ways. I've discussed this issue with a number of senators, including uh, Senator Patrick, uh, in, uh, in that regard. Uh, I could equally uh, point out, Senator Lambie, uh, that you have just used one of the questions allocated to you in question time uh, to pursue this matter of Senate process and procedure. Uh, you could have used it to raise any number of issues that you might have wished to do in a motion instead. Um, and that is one of the other avenues available to all senators in this place to be able to pursue uh, their issues. Uh, there are countless avenues available to senators to pursue different issues in this parliament. It doesn't have to be through a general business notice of motion, and I would encourage you and other senators to avail yourself of those different procedures in the standing orders as is appropriate uh, to have your say on behalf of your state or territory. Senator Sheldon. Well, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. On what date did the Minister first become aware of allegations of rape made by her former staff member? What action did the Minister take as a result? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, I thank the Senator for, uh, for that question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, can I just address a couple of the questions that somewhat took me by surprise uh, the, previously, and I will come to, to that, uh, Senator. Uh, I can confirm, I've just checked, and I can confirm that my second staff member, he was terminated shortly after uh, this incident occurred, and it was for a security breach. Uh, I do not re recollect any contact I've had with him since then, and I certainly cannot recollect sending, doing a reference for him. But I have got, now that uh, this issue has been raised, I'm now doing a search of files uh, just to determine that that is true. But I have no recollection, and I can't imagine any circumstance that I would. But again, uh, I, I, will check, I will check that. Yeah, no, ab absolutely, of course. Um, so he was terminated for a security breach. He was terminated for a security breach. Oh. Or Sorry, mm. Senator, Senator yep. Reynolds. Um, sorry. So, in in, so, in relation to the uh, to the last question, uh, the the dates, as I said, I, Senator, you probably know more about the incidents uh, surrounding the incident itself, or at least other members of this chamber do, because there's been a parliamentary inquiry into the circumstances of when and how I was told. So, uh, all of all of all of those details, all of those details. Um, I will provide uh, to, to the investigation. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Yes. Order. On what date did the minister first become aware that the allegations of rape made by her former staff member related to conduct on her couch in her ministerial office? What action did the minister take as a result? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And in my answer yesterday and uh, in my answer again today, I have gone through those details. And as I've said, it's now subject. All of all of the detail is subject to an AFP investigation and to at least two other inquiries. So I will be, as I've said, providing all information and assistance uh, to those inquiries. Oh, sorry, Senator Reynolds. I've got Senator Sheldon on a point of order. Well, it's, it's relevance. The, I understand very clearly that. Ms. Um, Brittany Higgins has said that she uh, is comfortable with these questions being asked. I think it's important that we get to um, these questions being answered, um, and there is the capacity for the minister to dutifully answer them. Um, I, I, I'm, I have allowed you to make that point, Senator Sheldon. I don't think I can rule the minister as being not directly relevant with the answer she's given. Senator Reynolds, have you to continue? Thank you very much, Mr. President. And noting uh, what the senator has just said, I think it's even more important that we don't politicise that information any further in this chamber. Her trauma was incredibly raw and evident last night, and I think it is appropriate that all of this information is collected by the AFP, uh, who had opened uh, an inquiry into this two years ago and Order. into here. So, Order. Mr. Mr President, I think Order. that is the appropriate course of action Order on my left. Uh, for from here on in. Order. I'm going to call Senator Sheldon when there's silence. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. 
The minister's former staff member was allegedly raped in the defence minister's office almost two years ago. When was the prime minister's office informed and how? And when was the prime minister informed and how? Senator Reynolds. Look, again, I thank uh, the senator for that question. And as I've said, uh, I, well, as I'll say now, I cannot speak for the prime minister, and I understand he's been addressing that. I, I cannot speak for the Prime Minister and I will not speak for the Prime Minister. And I understand your colleagues are asking those questions today uh, in the House of Representatives. All I can answer and all I can be responsible for is my own conduct and my responsibilities and how I enacted them. I will do that. I will do that not in this chamber. I will do it as appropriate with the Australian Federal Police. I have provided that information as much as I think is appropriate, Order. and there will be the forums to do that. Order. Order. I'll call Senator McKenzie when the silence. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Is the minister concerned at reports that legislation is being jointly lodged by Democrat and Republican members of the United States Congress seeking to ban imports of kangaroo products to the USA. The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, and can I thank Senator McKenzie for her question and in doing so acknowledge one of our previous colleagues in this place, uh, um, uh, the previous Senator Ron Boswell, for his very strong interest uh, in all things agriculture, but particularly uh, the Australia's kangaroo industry that he had such a huge, huge interest in. Um, but yes, Senator McKenzie, we are very concerned about the proposed legislation that is, uh, has been uh, lodged by a United States congressman, which seeks to ban the import of kangaroo um, meat and products into the US. We believe um, that the commercial kangaroo industry in Australia is absolutely appropriate and highly regulated. Um, it's highly sustainable, and our quotas are based on a science-based approach. Um, our commercial industry it has been going now for over 60 years and is considered one of the world's best wild harvest industries uh, in totality. Um, the management of uh, the export of kangaroo products is based firmly on the principles of sustainability, uh, and the industry is a huge provider of jobs, but particularly jobs in rural and regional um, Australia. And it's very often that those jobs are actually taken up by uh, Indigenous Australians. Australian uh, exports of kangaroo products like meat and hides and skins uh, to around 70 countries around the world, uh, including places like Italy and the United States. Um, and although the United States is not a huge import, direct importer of kangaroo meats, it is a huge importer of kangaroo leather products. And these leather products are considered to be some of the highest quality leather products in the world. Um, but we are aware of the potential risks this legislation poses for the industry, given the size of the US market and that global brands could be forced through pressure to move away from using this sustainably harvested product uh, is of great concern to the government. So that's why we have been working to gain um, support of industry so that we can put pressure Order, on Senator the Rustin. US. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Good to hear, Minister. Um, what damage would an import ban have on our industry, regional communities, farmers and the welfare of kangaroos? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, um, we know that the coronavirus has had a big impact on all of our rural and regional industries, and, and the kangaroo uh, export business is, is no different. But they have been amazingly adaptable and, and resilient. Um, but a ban that has, well, any ban um, of an international market will have large um, implications. But it's not just because of our direct exports to the, the US, but because much of our kangaroo product goes via other markets and manufactured into great leather goods, uh, and then they're imported into the US. So it's estimated that the commercial kangaroo industry um, provides about $200 million per year to rural um, and regional Australian communities, and 3,000 people are employed in this industry. So it is a hugely important industry. But the fact is that harvest programs are ethically designed to reduce the significant impact that overabundant kangaroo populations can have on our natural environment. Um, and as regional centres would understand, kangaroo populations regularly explain booms Order. and busts. Senator Rustin. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Can you outline what urgent representations are being made by the Australian government to ensure the United States market remains open for the export of kangaroo products? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the government will continue to work to ensure that U.S. consumers can continue to buy Australia's high-quality, responsibly sourced kangaroo products. Um, upon hearing about the bill's introduction to the U.S. The, uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, the government spoke to the Australian ambassador to the U.S., um, uh, previous Senator Arthur Sinodinos, and emphasised the importance of this trade. Um, and about making sure that we understood that this was a, actually a humane management of kangaroo populations and the value of this industry across the whole of Australia. Um, Australian diplomats have, uh, have initiated contact with congressmen and plan to meet with them to outline Australia's significant concerns around this bill. There is a myth that persists that commercial kangaroo harvesting is a threat to the species. This is not true. Uh, the staff at our Washington Embassy are working to advocate for our kangaroo industry's credentials in sustainability and animal welfare areas and are setting the Order. story Senator straight. Senator Rustin. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. At the time Ms Higgins disclosed that an alleged rape had taken place in the Minister's office on the evening of the 22nd of March 2019, was the Minister's Chief of Staff a person who had previously worked for the Prime Minister. The minute, oh, sorry. person returned to the Prime Minister's office after working for Minister Reynolds. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, I'm aware uh, of uh, Senator Reynolds's former Chief of Staff uh, at that point in time. I can't recall offhand Senator Wong in terms of uh, the sequence uh, of the different offices that, uh, that she has worked in, uh, but I will take that on notice. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank, I thank the minister for taking the matter on notice and I ask a further question. Ms Higgins has said that the Prime Minister's principal private secretary, whom she describes as Mr Morrison's fixer, was involved in the week after the alleged rape. On what basis? Was the Prime Minister's principal private secretary involved? What was his role? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, I am not aware. Uh, I understand the Prime Minister has uh, answered some questions directly uh, in relation to um, uh, the uh, contact or otherwise with the principal private secretary, and I'd refer the Senator to the Prime Minister's answers to those questions. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Well, I would ask the minister to come back and respond to those, that question. I ask a further question. Uh, Ms Higgins has said that the Prime Minister's principal private secretary contact her, contacted her to check in on her when she was off work in the week following Four Corners airing its Inside the Canberra Bubble expose of sexual misconduct within the coalition government. Can the minister explain why the Prime Minister's principal private secretary made that contact? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, I'd refer uh, the senator to my previous answer. I am not, um, uh, not all of those uh, statements, I think, are uh, necessarily accepted in relation to some of the responses that have been given. Uh, however, uh, if there is anything to add to that, I will bring it to the chamber. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. The COVID-19 pandemic highlighted the importance of accessible quality and professional financial advice. What has the Morrison government done to progress the professionalism of the finance industry, advice industry and make high quality advice accessible to Australian households? The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to thank Senator Brockman for his question and for his enduring commitment to quality, accessible and affordable professional financial advice. This government has taken significant action to professionalise the financial advice industry. We've put in place renewed professional standards for those who work in the advice industry, including an exam, a degree requirements, a code of ethics and continuing education requirements. Now, these standards have helped ensure that Australians can be confident that when they need guidance on their personal finances, that they are receiving high quality and professional financial advice. 
Mr. President, I would like to congratulate the nearly 12,000 now financial advisers, stockbrokers, planners and those in the life insurance industry who have taken and already passed the financial advisor standards exam so far. The average pass rate of that exam is 90 per cent, and that's a testament to their hard work, to their skill and to their dedication to the profession, as well as to their commitment to making high-quality financial advice available to every Australian household. Even over the summer break, Mr President, a further 1,200 advisers sat the exam across 14 Australian cities and online. They are now awaiting those results, ready to demonstrate to their clients that they are the committed professionals that their clients expect. And I would like to encourage practising financial advisers, stockbrokers and insurance advisers who have not yet taken the exam or passed the exam to take advantage of the remaining sittings left in 2021 before the deadline ends at the end of this year. I ask you to work with us to make the Australian advice industry the best it can possibly be, because together we can achieve our goal of creating a world-class industry that offers affordable, accessible and high-quality financial advice for all Australians. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How has the government supported the transition for the financial advice in industry during the COVID-19 during COVID to ensure that remote advisers, those with family commitments, and those affected by COVID-19 compl can complete these requirements? Senator Hume. Mr. President, the Morrison government has extended the transition period, and advisers now have until January 2026 to complete the education requirements set before them. They also now have until the end of 2021 to pass the exam, but I remind them that with time ticking, it's very important to note that there are only a further three opportunities to do so this year. We hope that all existing advisers will make the most of these very important opportunities. We have provided remote sitting options to assist advisers to sit the exam during the pandemic, and many have taken up that opportunity. The online exam can be taken at any time of the day or night, uh, during any day or each and every day of the six-day sitting period, giving advisers the maximum flexibility to fit around work and family commitments. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline uh, further to the Senate how financial advisers can sit the exam? Senator Hume. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. The next exam sitting will be held between the 25th and the 30th of March this year, including on weekends and with up to two in-person sittings each day. The exam can also be taken online or in person in 16 cities across Australia, both metropolitan and regional. The booking period for the March exam is currently open online, and preparation materials are available on the FASIA website and via private providers. Mr. President, when my financial adviser, uh, I won't name him because you'll get embarrassed, uh, received his results, he was so pleased he sent me a text message. Now, even for a highly skilled and educated advisor as he is, he already has a master's degree in finance, he knew that this was a new level of professionalism for him and for his firm. I encourage all financial advisers who have not yet passed this exam to register for this sitting. With your help, we can make the best financial planning and stockbroking and insurance advisory industry our best, the best in the world. Senator Birmingham. Senator Urquhart. Deputy President, um, understanding Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the Minister for Communications, who is represented by Senator Hume in this changer, chamber, as to why portfolio questions numbered 301, 302, 303, 304, 305, 307, 309, 311, 312, 318, 321, 323, 325, 326, 328, 330, 331, 332, 333, 334, 335, 336, 337, 338, 339, 340, 
341, 342 and 344, which I placed on notice on 17 November 2020, remains unanswered. Minister. Uh, thank you, and I thank the senator for her statement. I won't ask you to repeat those numbers. I didn't write them all down. I am advised that the questions on notice from budget estimates 2020-21 that are being sought were asked of the National Broadband Network Corporation (NBN Co). Now I understand that the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications have repeatedly encouraged NBN Co to provide those responses in a timely manner. I will contact the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, uh, Cities and the Arts in relation to these questions. Senator Urquhart. Deputy President, under Standing Order 745B, I move that the Senate take note of the explanation. Now, let us be Based on the evidence we have received from the committee, the overwhelming majority of these questions, as the minister is aware, as she just outlined, to NBNCO were due on 21 December 2020. Today is 16 February 2021. This means that the questions outlined are now 58 days overdue and counting, which is simply unacceptable. And I understand that there are a number of other questions which other senators have placed on notice in the Senate to NBNCO and which are also overdue, significantly overdue. This lack of responsiveness reflects very poorly on the Minister for Communications and very poorly on NBNCO. More broadly, it underscores a lack of respect for Senate accountability, which has plagued the communications portfolio throughout the parliamentary term of this government. Labor calls on the Morrison government and NBNCO to release these questions immediately and stop disrespecting the intelligence of Australian taxpayers. The majority of the questions on notice go directly, directly to the economics of the NBN and financial metrics underpinning the 2021 NBN corporate plan. They go to the issues such as debt, cash flows, cost per premises, operating costs, capital expenditures, bonuses and a range of other information that allow the parliament, the media and the Australian public better understand what, what was happening with our public money. In fact, much of this information was consistently published in previous corporate plans. But this year, the government decided to withhold this information because they did not want the media or the parliament to have visibility of its latest cost blowouts. It's another smokescreen. It's another cover-up. So today the Senate seeks an answer to that question. What exactly is the Morrison government trying to hide by not answering these questions and allowing them to be answered? What we know is that the release of NBNCO's corporate plan was delayed this year. It's normally released on the 31st of August, but this year, sorry, it was held, uh, it's been delayed, but it was uh, withheld until the 23rd of September. So notably, it was withheld until the afternoon after Minister Fletcher had announced the government's embarrassing copper backflip at the National Press Club. And then when the corporate plan came out later that afternoon, it immediately became clear that key information published in previous corporate plans had been omitted. So laughable were the redactions that the revised cost of the NBN $57 billion was not mentioned anywhere in the document. Shy. In terms of the information sought by the questions on notice, we know this information is held the with the Chief Financial Officer and could have been provided to the Senate in December. We know that MBN Co's Corporate Affairs Division is among the best resourced Corporate Affairs Division in the country, if not the best resourced. We also know that the delay of these responses is not an accident. 
It's intentional. It's clear that the intent was to withhold this information. NBN Co and the government have gone to great lengths to prevent the Chief Financial Officer of NBN Co from appearing before the Senate and other parliamentary committees. The one time the Chief Financial Officer was forced to appear under the threat of a Senate order, the Chief Executive Officer of NBN Co wouldn't allow him to open his mouth and respond to any question of substance. It was the most curious form of witness protection. There is a very simple reason that the Minister for Communications is seeking to delay the release of this information. This government's inferior NBN has not been faster and it has not been cheaper. On every measure, this technological debacle is slower, is less re reliable and is more expensive. Let it be lost on nobody that in 2013 the Liberals, standing on, alongside a hologram of Sonny Bill Williams at Fox Studios, promised their second-rate version of the NBN would be delivered for $29.5 billion. Then it blew out in 2014 to $41 billion. Then it blew out again to $49 billion in 2015. Then it increased to $51 billion in 2018. By late 2020, it had surged again to a forecast of $57 billion. What a shame that the technology hadn't surged as fast. Worse still, the government even tried to cover this figure up and have their public officials invent a new accounting methodology to talk about the costs of NBN. It took less than 90 days from when the rollout was supposed to be complete for the government to begin desperately backflipping towards fibre, imposing greater cost and time on consumers and taxpayers. If you want the Oxford definition of incompetence and waste, look no further than the Liberals and this hapless Minister for Communications and their technological omelette known as the NBN multi-technology mix. The, Liberal promi the Liberals promised every Australian would have access to minimum speeds of 20 mi 25 megabits per second by 2016. We are now in 2021, five years on, and these minimum speeds are not being delivered still over the copper NBN network. According to reports, up to 238,000 households still cannot access minimum speeds, which are actually a requirement of both Australian law and the NBN statement of expectations. The Liberal Party, yes, I'm referring to the same Liberal Party who are on track to amass a $1 trillion in debt, has used taxpayer money to purchase over 49,000 kilometres of new copper for the NBN. That's enough copper to wrap around planet Earth and the sum then left over. Labor has even heard that the government maxed out the copper supply in Australia and had to start importing copper from Turkey and Brazil. If you're a global copper trader, the Morrison government is your best friend. And who can forget when Malcolm Turnbull, the now, then Prime Minister and now Minister Fletcher, hailed HFC technology as the great game changer. M uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, it most certainly did change the game, but for all the wrong reasons. Never has the rollout of network technology in Australia been more of a shambles. The NBN HCF rollout is the most uneconomical and arguable the most unreliable in the world. There is a good reason former NBN Co CEO Bill Morrow wanted to toss the entire HFC footprint in the bin. There's good reason that Mike Quigley and his management team also rejected the use of HFC under Labor. After talking it up as the best thing since sliced bread, the Liberals had to scrap the Optus HFC network because it was not fit for purpose. A humiliation. Then they had to pause the rollout 
of the remaining HFC network in November 2017 because the technology was so unreliable. Turning on your vacuum cleaner was enough to cause your internet to drop out. And just last fortnight, we found out that MBNCO will pause activations on the HFC network because they have run out of the chips for their modems. What a hot mess. No wonder Lontil, a Tasmanian ISP provider, recently wrote a blog referring to HFC as a dog's breakfast and singling it out as the most unreliable technology on the NBN network. Remember, this was the stuff that the um, uh, previous Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, hailed as a game changer. It is quoted as, uh, as a uh, Tasmanian ISP as saying it's the most unreliable technology on the NBN network. So this brings me to the performance of the NBN during lightning storms. We've been hearing reports from the Blue Mountains, the Hawkesbury regions, parts of Greater Sydney and Outer Melbourne, that fibre to the curb modems on the NBN have been literally getting fried during lightning storms, with some households requiring up to six modem replacements, with technicians having to visit each time. Not very efficient. There's been an unacceptable lack of transparency on this issue, but from what we understand, lightning is causing a voltage surge down the copper line and into the modem. The Liberals had one job, and that was not to stuff up, stuff up fibre to the curb like they stuffed up everything else. This entails ensuring that the electronics and vendor equipment used to deliver the service were fit for purpose and had adequate surge protections. If storms are capable of blowing up six consecutive NBN modems, then something is not right. When political parties are incapable of taking a long-term view and consistently put politics ahead of the public interest, it invariably extracts a heavy price. Australians have paid more and gotten a worse NBN. And no matter how much spin the Liberals churn out, that is the stark reality. This build a dud and black flip it later approach means MBN Co is now borrowing billions more to construct a fibre network that will run in parallel with the existing copper network. Critically, despite new cost blowouts and rhetoric about upgrades, the government has currently only budgeted for one in 10 households in the copper footprint—400,000 premises to receive a fibre lead-in between now and 2024. On top of this, the full copper network will have to be operated and maintained, while the fibre network constructed in parallel goes underutilised. Remember that's that copper that wraps around the planet and the sum left over? A lot of that's going to be now underutilised. You would, in all sincerity, be hard-pressed to think up a more illogical and costly way to deploy a national broadband network with, more, with public money. After $51 billion, the purchase of 50,000 kilometres of new copper and a decade of ridiculing fibre, not only has this government forfeited its credibility, but they have done so without explaining what the real cost of their capitulation is. This black flip is not simply a vindication of Labor policy, but an affirmation of something more fundamental the Liberals get the, wrong, the big calls wrong. And to sum all this up, we have a minister and a public company which has spent $57 billion of taxpayers' money disrespecting the Senate and seeking to evade security and scrutiny. We have a copper network that is so defunct it still cannot deliver minimum speeds to up to 238,000 premises. We have a HCF network that is arguably one of the biggest and most expensive telecommunication debacles in the world. We have modems literally frying because of lightning surges, surges down copper leading cables. Evidently, the decision in 2013 to dump fibre has resulted in a colossal waste of time and money. Do it once, do it right, do it with fibre. Had the Liberals simply followed this path, 
Australians would have a faster and more reliable network at far less cost to the taxpayer. Little wonder we have a dud NBN at a cost now forecast to reach $57 billion, nearly $30 billion over budget, rank 61 globally for speeds and a rollout schedule running more than four years behind what the Liberals originally promised. They said they could do it better, they said they could do it cheaper, and they haven't delivered on any of that. Madam, Acting De uh, Madam Deputy President, it's no wonder that this government is trying to evade scrutiny. It is really no wonder at all. And I would call on the government to ensure that they hold NBN to account and that they provide the answers to these questions and that they provide an open and transparent process through the Senate processes, estimates and other areas, and they should be Thank scrutinised. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Your time has expired. Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Deputy President. Understanding Order 74, subsection 5, subsection A, I rise to speak on the explanation sought by my colleague and friend, Senator Urquhart, of the Minister for Communications, represented by Senator Hume in this chamber. I won't read through the numbers of the questions on notice. With encouragement from my uh, from Senator Urquhart, I will. 301, 302, 303, 304, 305. Good news, they managed to answer 306. 307, also managed to answer 308. 309 is unanswered. 311, 312, 318, 321, 323. Um, Senator Kitchen, just resume your seat for a moment. Senator Already. Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. These have already been read into Hansard. I would uh, raise tedious repetition. Uh, there's no point of order. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Kitchen. We continue. Thank you, Deputy President. So I think I got up to 318, 321, 323, 325, 326, 328, 330, 331. 332, 333, 334, 335, 336, 337, 338, 339, 340, 341, 342 and 344. And of course that isn't tedious repetition as was suggested by Senator Brockman. It's actually just embarrassing for the government that they have an agency that thinks that they are above the standing orders of this chamber, and that is actually the problem. So no one, no one on the other side wanted to actually hear all of those numbers of the questions outstanding. So who does the NBN think they are? Because remember, committee me members were told informally that they wouldn't get any answers until the end of January. So in this blithe, you know non-acceptance of the Senate standing orders, the NBN decided that they would set their own timetable. So anyway, we'll get to, those, to, to more of their outrageous antics later on. Clause 74 of the Senate standing orders provides that a minister has 30 days in which to provide an answer to a question. As at midday today, the 16th of February 2021, also my birthday, Deputy President, there are 118 overdue questions on notice lodged by, via the table office, the oldest being 62 days overdue. There are 345 questions on notice which have been taken by the communications portfolio in the 2020-2021 budget estimates. The committee set the following due dates for questions on notice, 3 December 2020 for the initial hearing and 21 December for the spillover hearing. 239 questions were taken on notice during and post the initial estimates hearing. Only 59 were returned to the committee on time and 180 were or are overdue. That being 75 per cent of the questions and 30 still, 32 still have not been answered. 106 questions were taken on notice during and post the spillover estimates hearing. Only nine were returned to the committee on time. 97 were or are overdue, that being 91 per cent of the questions are overdue, and 49 still haven't been answered. What this actually shows is a clear pattern 
of disrespect and lack of transparency and accountability by the Minister for Communications, Minister Fletcher, and his representing minister in this place. There are two particular agencies that are among the most egregious in their constant and continued attempts to withhold information sought by me through the question on notice process. And I do not say this lightly. With the exception of the Department of Parliamentary Services, whose constant evasions and obfuscations are masterly, and that is a bit of an understatement, both the National Broadband Network Co and Australia Post are perhaps the worst I have ever seen. As someone who has entered many, many questions on notice, over 11,000, uh, in the life of this parliament alone, I do not say this lightly. I must preface this by making the point that this is in no way a slight on the hardworking men and women in these organisations. Remember, it was a party to which I belong, the Australian Labor Party and our union affiliates, that, who saw off an attempt by this government and the former CEO of Australia Post to sack a quarter of our nation's posties under the cover of the coronavirus pandemic. It was also the grand vision of my predecessor in this place, uh, Senator Conroy, um, that realised a national broadband network. That was to give all Australians a world-class access to the internet. And we've heard from Senator Urquhart uh, some of the problems with that. We on this side stand up for those workers every day. What we don't stand up for are senior executives at public sector government business enterprises who take, remember, they take no corporate risk. They are remunerated extremely well. They stonewall questions put to them by the nation's parliament on behalf of the people of Australia, just like they were company directors at an annual meeting, avoiding the scrutiny of their shareholders. Let me start with the MBN and their senior executives and their board. The MBN is an organisation, which I discovered through a question on notice, which they actually answered, mind you. Um, it has 13 employees earning over $500,001, 21 employees earning between $400,001 and $500,000, 110 employees earning between $300,001 and $400,000, and 733 employees earning between $200,001 and $300,000. Their conspiracy of silence is a disgrace. They do not get to choose to keep secrets from the taxpayer and the parliament. It is dis disrespectful, disrespectful to the people who are paying their large salaries, the same people who will be paying the bills racked up by this organisation for a long time, and no doubt their children and their children's children will also be still paying these bills. They are the same Australians who put us here and who expect us to do our job, and part of that job is to keep the government accountable and to ensure that there is scrutiny on government departments and agencies. Labor has even heard that the government maxed out the copper supply in Australia and had to start importing copper from Turkey and Brazil. But let me read you some of the questions on notice that are outstanding in relation to the NBN. How many executives received an increase to their base salary in the 2019-2020 financial year? In each of the 2018-2019 and 2019-2020 financial years and the 2020-2021 financial year to date, has NBN engaged, employed or hired the services of a media personality? If so, who was engaged, employed or hired, for what purpose and at what cost? Please produce a copy of the Register of Declarations of Interest as at 1 December 2020. So you might, let's just take that last question. You might think that that was a fairly easy question to answer if you're an organised entity and you know you, your documents are organised. You should be able to produce that quickly. But no, we're still waiting for that one. NBN Co and the government have gone to great lengths to prevent their chief financial officer from appearing before Senate, the Senate and other parliamentary committees. The one time the Chief Financial Officer was forced to appear no. under the th threat of a Senate order, the Chief Executive Officer of NBN Co wouldn't allow him to open his mouth and respond to any of my questions um, that were being put to him. It was a total joke. I also had to insist that the legal counsel of NBN Co come to estimates because, not surprisingly, you have to put in FOIs in order to get NBN Co uh, to actually respond to anything, and they haven't responded to the FOIs either, so you know, we shouldn't get our hopes up. It was a strange performance. 
The Chief Financial Officer was more reminiscent of a hostage than a senior public executive fronting up to answer questions about the expenditure of public monies. You know, it's a little like the end of the film Thelma and Louise. The NBN's, NBN Co CEO is sort of Louise driving off the cliff with the unaccountable minister being his Thelma at the wheel. And as for the performance of NBN Co executives at Estimates, it is a masterclass in obfuscation and how not to answer a question. These fat cats at NBN can run, but they will not be able to hide. It is just a matter of time and how poorly they want to look in the meantime before this parliament will get the answers to the questions we seek. At some point, they are going to have to answer what are pretty basic and easy questions to answer. But maybe we can't assume that their records are in any state that is fit for a, a, an entity of that size and they can't actually access anything because there is no excuse for their inability to not be able to produce those documents. They spend a fortune on PR gurus um, who usually defend such upstanding corporate citizens as James Hardy. That's the, um, you know, that's Australia Post where they've employed Ross Thornton there uh, and actually can't seem to locate how many hours uh, he has uh, put in there. So uh, that's another lot of questions on notice that we have to another agency, another government-owned business uh, that is being, you know, is answerable supposedly to Minister Fletcher. So I just want to go through some of this. Um, so they've employ, em, employed a PR guru there. He's worked for James Hardy, AMP, who during the Banking Royal Commission, let us not forget, were found to be charging fees to dead people. Um, uh, and if you look to the board of Australia Post, which is full of people connected uh, who have Liberal Party connections, and they are now on uh, what is a pretty prestigious board, the Australia Post board. So what we've heard even well before you know, we had Cartier watches being purchased for already well remunerated executives, we heard extraordinary stories of the former CEO, Ms Holgate, racking up hundreds of thousands on the corporate credit card, spending eye-watering amounts of fresh, flora on flesh, fresh floral arrangements and plants for the office at a time when everyone was working from home. So they were putting these floral arrangements into the offices when no one was there. Uh, and the board was trying to approve exorbitant bonuses for themselves. The spectacle of one pampered poodle after another defending the right of a multi-million dollar salaried public servant using public money to buy luxury watches as personal gifts for favoured staff is one that defies credulity. But perhaps we shouldn't be surprised. In some ways, I think the NBN situation is actually worse than anything Christine Holgate did. Ms Holgate shows a reflection of a fundamental misunderstanding of her role, her duties and her obligations as a public sector CEO. The Cartier watches, the floral arrangements, the bonuses they tried to approve for the executive team um, at nearly, nearly around about a million dollars each. Um, and of course, you know, there she was asserting that Australia Post money isn't, is not taxpayer money. Of course, Australia Post is very much a government-owned organisation and it actually belongs to all of us. We all use it. It is a part of every Australian's life. Her answers revealed a very unhealthy culture that I feared explained much about the profligate spending culture at Australia Post uh, that you know, the hundreds of questions on notice exposed. Let me now read you some questions on notice that are outstanding in relation to Australia Post. Please provide Australia Post board documents, including but not limited to board meeting agendas, board papers and board meeting minutes created between October 2018 to December 2018. So that's, remember, that's October 2018 to December 2018, which reference or relate to rewards, gifts or bonuses for any Australia Post employee, manager or executive. So we've got October, November, December, and they still can't find those. There's this exchange between myself and then the then Australia Post CFO and now acting CEO Rodney Boys, and also apparently likely to become the CEO from an estimate spillover session. Mr Boys, do you think you will be able to respond to my question on notice fully in terms of a breakdown of the expenditure on the office of the CEO credit card? You said you could not answer because everyone was working at home from coronavirus. We had a brief discussion at last estimates and you said we could not answer that because people are working at home and we had a discussion about whether you did any online banking. So remember, this is the CFO of Australia Post. And whether you were able to do banking when you weren't in the office. 
are you going to be able to answer that question on notice properly and give us a breakdown of the expenditure? You won't be surprised to learn that we have yet to receive this information either. A large proportion of the answers that we seek here today, Deputy President, relate to the NBN's extraordinary entertainment spend, which the Morrison government refuses to provide automated reports from accounting software. So I've asked for a breakdown of $874,000 uh, in a financial year. Apparently, they are not able to break down that figure. NBN's aggregate of bonuses paid to its, its executives, whether or not NBN increased staff salaries during the APS pay freeze, NBN's internal FOI procedures, given the numerous FOIs lodged by me that have been resisted, requests from, for copies of Australia Post board documents, and breakdowns of executive-issued credit cards. But in actual fact today, the Senate seeks an answer to the following question above all. Above all, what exactly is this government and the Minister for Communications trying to hide? All the Liberals who sit opposite who were pre-selected on a mantra of small government and accountability should not be running interference for the spivs and grifters that seek to obfuscate and evade parliamentary scrutiny by refusing to answer questions on notice put to them by the Australian Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, this afternoon it is of grave concern to yet again see the lack of accountability of this government in relation to answering questions on notice. I did see Senator Hume come in here and explain that despite the minister's best endeavours that the Department of Communications has been unable to get NBN Co uh, to answer these questions. Well, I put to you that the troubles in this relationship and the troubles in the lack of accountability and the lack of reporting in outcomes of MBN Co's performance to this parliament uh, goes much, much, much deeper than that. For example, Senator Urquhart asked questions in relation to uh, the forecast in relation to the outstanding amount of debt and equity uh, by financial year 2024. How much in free cash flow does the 2021 corporate plan forecast NBN will generate uh, by financial year 2024? Have these cash flows been committed? If yes, towards what? What was the capex uh, for the fixed wireless network as at uh, 1 July 2020? How many fixed wireless towers have been built? How many fixed wireless cells have been deployed? Uh, based on the 2021 corporate plan, what is cumulative capex for the fixed wireless out to 2024? Now, these are issues that have been covered in previous corporate plans, uh, but for some reason the government and NBN Co saw fit not to uh, adequately explain uh, this information in their latest corporate uh, plan, and yet we find uh, even still, despite these questions being asked by uh, opposition senators, there are still no answers. The NBN corporate plan was missing information on peak funding from cost blowouts. No update on the NBN debt profile, again a question that was asked by Senator Urquhart. No updated capital expenditure by technology. You know, this is CapEx expenditure. It's a fairly basic thing to go in a corporate uh, plan, and yet we cannot even get these questions uh, answered in estimates. No operating expenditure profile. And so the corporate plan shows a complete lack of transparency, and as uh, the shadow uh, Minister uh, Michelle Rowland said she said it was nothing short of a cover-up designed to conceal unfunded announcements made by Mr. Fletcher today. Now the issue here, the issue here, is that this government keeps trying to assert that it is meeting the milestones uh, and connection milestones, and that it exceeds them and and is doing a great job 
in managing NBN Co to deliver to Australians. So it is little wonder to me that NBN Co, the Department of uh, Communications, are also dragging the, their feet in answering these questions because, again, what it exposes is cost blowouts and consumer disappointment when the promises that the government has made are simply not met. I'll take you to some of the questions asked uh, by Senator Green in estimates. Uh, Senator Green asked uh, in relation to the 1.5 million premises being GFAST enabled. One of them said it would be by 2020, and the minister is now saying it's 2023. Senator Green asks why won't fibre to the curb network be gigabyte gigabytes capable by the end of 2020. And Mr Windy here, the key official answering these questions from the Department of Communications, he says, well, there are some details in here worth raising with NBN or we can take them on notice. I think NBN will be able to answer for you when they appear uh, exactly what the state of the FTTC network is and its readiness. But as we see in the kinds of questions that rem uh, remain unanswered, it shows that the Department of Communications said, here, let, the uh, let NBN Co answer these questions. We could take it on notice, but best direct your questions over there. Well, perhaps we should have asked both NBN Co and the department some of these questions, because now we've got the department complaining that they can't get NBN Co to answer these questions in a timely manner. Well, what does this show about the accountability of this government in relation to the promises that it has made to the Australian people in relation to its NBN network? It is in an appalling state of affairs. I uh, have been speaking to constituents that have been sold, uh, uh, have responded to marketing, uh, where they've signed up to certain megabit levels uh, that simply cannot be met by the current infrastructure that, they, that exists in their local area and that essentially they have been sold. They have been sold something that doesn't exist in their area. And so when Senator Urquhart asks uh, at question 188 how many FTTN premises cannot currently achieve a layer 2 speed of 25 megabits per second and they haven't answered it, what we're really talking about here is Australian consumers that were sold a dud product where we have a government that refuses to be accountable for the promises that it made. This is an appalling state of affairs. And while some uh, I've seen many a government official at estimates complain about the number of questions that Senator Kitching asks, and they tend to kind of go, oh, here we go again. But there is a real relationship between things like executive bonuses flowers bought uh, and kind of corporate culture, how much is spent on entertainment and the like, when you relate that back to poor performance and accountability, the promises that are made to the Australian people that this government is essentially responsible for that are not delivered. In 2013, the coalition promised every Australian that they would have access to minimum speeds of 25 millibytes per second by the end of 2016. They were asked, can NBN Co confirm this target was missed by up to 7 million premises? Now, we're here in 2021 now. You would have thought that somewhere in Minister Fletcher's accountability or the officers that the Department of Communications has sat with, that they would be tracking. They'd be tracking their promises 
and that they would be able to say uh, that the department would be able to answer, that the ministers uh, would be able to answer, and indeed that NBN Co would be able to answer basic questions about the promises that they made in their, uh, uh, as a government and that they are tracking those outcomes. But again, here you can see in these unanswered questions, we've got on one hand a government that likes to make big promises and pays no attention to the detail of getting it delivered. Not only is it the uh, government not paying attention to detail, but it seemed to me, in the answers given by officials, uh, that they didn't have the technical know-how at a senior level to be able to answer the questions about the milestones that NBN Co should be meeting, the milestones that NBN Co should be meeting in order to meet these commitments. Now that to me seems like an extraordinary state of affairs. So Senator Green uh, also asked in estimates, uh, Senator Green said, uh, uh, you don't have the details of the $70 per home uh, that it's going to by the government. And Mr Windy Year said, no, I don't have the technical details that NBN is going to be spending money on over the next few years with respect to the FTTC network. I'll take that on notice, but I think they'll be happy to answer it. I think I have to hand over, uh, but you said this was a, signif a significant upgrade, and it's so significant that you don't know what it is. Mr Atkinson from the department says, can we just assist with this? I think what Mr Windyear is saying, you'll get a better answer from the people who are actually going to be implementing the upgrade on the technical aspects of exactly what's going to happen to the FTTC. And yet we see that we ask technical questions of NBN Co. Senator Hume comes in here and says uh, the department is doing their best to get answers uh, from NBN Co. And yet the department uh, doesn't have the expertise to answer them themselves, which I think they should have. Uh, these are major uh, announcements uh, that are embedded in the translation between the announcements that the government has made, the relationship of the department with NBN Co that holds together that accountability to the Australian public. And still, we come in here and Senator Hume says, oh, we're doing our best to get NBN Co to answer these questions. Well, I remind Minister uh, Fletcher and Senator Hume, who was indeed at the table at the time, I remind Senator Hume that it was the department that directed many of these questions to NBN Co, questions that I believe they should have been able to answer. And they are questions I think that very much uh, the failure to answer these questions very much underpins the disaster that is now. Uh, the NBN and data promises that this government has made to the Australian people about the technology that sh they should be able to have access to at work, at home and in the broader community. I will have to say today that uh, the kinds of issues that are being raised by the opposition uh, in relation to NBN Co's financial year 2020 results. Uh, again, you can see NBN Co and the government trying to self-congratulate themselves about their outcomes. And yet, when you dig down into the data, if you can get it through uh, these processes, because the department doesn't seem to be able to ask NBN Co uh, for this accountability, uh, that actually the claims being made don't, uh, don't stand up. So NBN Co, uh, by all reports in their, in their data, showed a great uh, uh, outcome over COVID-19 for completing the volume rollout. But in this parliament, we have a duty 
to scrutinise the kinds of claims being made. And indeed, the technology uh, mix of the multi-technology mix that the government has promoted, the cost blowout from that has gone from $29.5 billion to $41 to $49 and now $51. And yet, uh, the kinds of questions we ask about the corporate plan, which Senator Urquhart has asked, highlighted uh, that the 2020 corporate plan saw significant revision downwards in targets, making it easier to exceed the stated claim uh, and claim credit for having done so. If you compare the 2020 results uh, compared to the unrevised 2019 corporate plan forecasts, capital costs are up $1.5 billion and revenue is down $100 billion. And yet the kinds of questions that Senator Urquhart asked about capital expenditure remain unanswered. It is little surprise to me that NBN Co is dragging its feet in answering these questions, but I find it completely galling that the government pretends it wants to be completely accountable to this parliament and it's some kind of administrative accountability when we know that these issues go right down to the core of the disaster that is this government's uh, commitments uh, to the Australian people in relation to the NBN. Thank you, Senator Pratt. I don't believe there's any further questions. I just need to put the question, Senator Gallagher, on this matter. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Urquhart to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So are there any motions to take note of answers, Senator Gallagher? Madam Deputy President. Sorry, Senator Rennick, do you have a contribution? I rise to take note of the answers given to Senator Birmingham and Senator Reynolds to the questions asked by Senator Ciccone and myself. Well, the Minister for Defence came into this chamber today, not on her own initiative, but in response to a question asked of her. And you know what? It's two years too late. She apologises to Ms Higgins for her treatment by herself and her office two years later. Minister, nice words, saying the right thing now does not compensate nor forgive two years of doing nothing. Minister Reynolds' apology might be more believable if something, anything, had been done at any stage to support Ms Higgins following her disclosure. But nothing was done then and nothing's being done now. Has anyone from this government reached out to Ms Higgins? To offer any support. The Defence Minister said she could see the trauma and hurt to Ms Higgins in the TV interview. But has anyone followed up with her? Has anyone, any agency, reached out to see if any support can be provided now by her former employer? I doubt it. Today, the Defence Minister of Australia, in responding to allegations of a rape occurring on her couch in her office uses the excuse of a possible police investigation to hide behind, to deny this chamber and Ms Higgins answers that should be provided now. Senator Reynolds, the Defence Minister of Australia, is accountable to this chamber and through us to the people of Australia for her conduct as a minister. The question Senator Reynolds refuses to answer goes directly to her conduct, to what she knew, to when she knew it, to what she did, to the steps she took as a minister to deal with allegations about a serious crime occurring in her office. We will continue to hold this minister to account. This is not some minor political inconvenience. This is about what happens in one of the most senior offices in this country. A full statement outlining exactly what the minister knew, when she knew it and what was done, none of which is subject to a police investigation to our understanding, is the minimum amount of information this minister should be providing to this chamber. And, Madam Deputy President, some of what the Defence Minister has said to date in this chamber simply does not add up. She says that at the same time she would have us believe she didn't know 
the details of what was alleged to have occurred on her couch in her office, she at the same time facilitated the police involvement. She terminated the alleged rapist. That some six days had elapsed from Ms Higgins' disclosure to the minister's chief of staff before the minister met with Ms Higgins and at that meeting, which brought Ms Higgins back into the scene of the alleged rape, that the minister was still unaware of any details about the incident? The minister would have the chamber believe that, despite many others knowing of the incident, including a number of agencies and her chief of staff, who had met and received a full disclosure from Ms Higgins, that this minister did not know any of the details? Which then leads one to ask, did she not ask? Did she not wonder why one of her close advisers had all of a sudden disappeared? Did she not ask her chief of staff whether she had been given an account of what occurred? Did she not wonder why she was meeting with a young woman coming into her office, just her and the chief of staff? Why was she having that meeting? Seriously, something like this happening in your own office and no one said anything, None, nothing to you? It's simply unbelievable. The only other explanation, aside from the Senate not being given accurate information to date, is that the minister was therefore willfully negligent in her duties as a minister and as an employer. We saw the Prime Minister laying the groundwork today to distance himself from this, first in the media conference and then in question time, and an apology two years too late is not going to get, make this go away. We need to get the story straight from this minister. She needs to stop avoiding answers, hiding behind investigations, and take responsibility for what happened to Ms Higgins and take responsibility Thank for her Senator position Gallagher, as a your minister. Time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. Something that can never be taken for granted is the right to work in a safe environment, whether that be a building site, on a cattle station or even in a parliamentary office. And workplace reform, especially for women, has come a long way, but more needs to be done to ensure that all people, both men and women, feel comfortable and empowered to take action should the worst occur. It is impossible not to sympathise with Brittany Higgins and others who have ensured the double blow of being involved in an incident and then not feeling supported by those who can do something about it. And yet I feel deeply uncomfortable. The opposition has raised this issue, pursued this issue and ensured that there will be other complainants who will now potentially be considering whether or not they want to be uh, publicly discussed in the way that the opposition has ensured that this has played out. Brittany's colleagues and managers certainly acted with good intentions, and Brittany herself has acknowledged the support she received. But processes can always be improved, and they will be. And I refer to the Prime Minister's statement today, uh, quest the first question in the uh, other place, where he refers to the process that has been put in place, that this government will review our processes, review our culture, and he has embraced the spirit, uh, the suggestion from the uh, leader of the opposition, uh, and thanked him for the suggestion and the spirit in which it was put forward. But, as he said, we all agree in the important work that we all do here, whether it's members of this place, senators, and the other place, our staff. We all come here because we want to make a contribution to our country and we should be able to do that in a safe environment for everyone who is here. So he welcomes that suggestion. So the government will continue along the process that the Prime Minister has outlined today. He's keen to get that moving and we will. But it is important that every party, everyone who is in this place, embrace uh, that same process. And the Prime Minister has encouraged the Leader of the Opposition to pursue a similar exercise amongst his colleagues. And I think as a government, as an opposition and the crossbench that we all, would all do well to review our own cultures 
and to come together to share uh, those notes and to ensure that the process is as productive as possible. Already, the government has aimed to provide Ms Higgins with agency, provide support to make decisions in her interests and to respect her privacy. These investigations into her experience are underway, and I'm confident that the system is in place to deal with ser serious allegations will be improved once a full review is completed, because having a safe, inclusive and supportive workplace is something everyone should strive for, not just one political party or one office. Our workplace has many elements that are not unique, a significant amount of travel and time away from home. But what is unique is the number of late nights and weekends that are worked. This is not unique to any side of politics, and I welcome the PM's review and hope that both sides will take advantage of this concept to look deeply into our own cultures. As a previous small business operator, I too know of the challenges of managing people, because we are, in all our glorious technicolour differences, uh, interesting and challenging. And I know that uh, we all embrace the challenge of ensuring a safe culture and a safe environment for our employees. And the Minister for Defence today has stood in this place and apologised, apologised to Ms Higgins and made a, a very comprehensive statement. But I do want to note that Ms, Brit Ms. Brittany's, uh, statement, Brittany's statement has concluded with this. I ask for my privacy to now be respected as I begin to emotionally recover from this difficult period and wish to make no further comment. And I would suggest that we would all be served by allowing the process to proceed and ensure that this does not happen again in this place. Okay. Uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you. I move to take note of the question asked by Senator Ciccone to Minister Birmingham. Uh, and Senator Ciccone asked about the plight of an aged care nurse. Anne, who has been in her profession since 1978, who expressed her concern about the government's IR legislation, saying it doesn't make things better for us and our residents, it makes it so much worse. And to be honest, I don't think I can handle any more cuts. Well, Prime Minister Morrison and Minister Porter have made it clear that they are only ditching their plan to scrap the better off overall test, uh, which is the test uh, in, in IR law that would have given the capacity for employers to strike agreements that made such cuts, not because uh, they uh, don't believe in it, not because they recognise that it's unfair, but because they can't get it through this Senate. The Labor Party is very firmly opposed to it, and now that some discussions have taken place with the crossbench, it's very clear uh, that there's only one motivation behind this government dropping this test, and that is that they don't have the opportunity to pass it. Mr Porter said very clearly he still believes in the change. A change that would remove the safety net for workers and give employers vastly expanded powers to cut pay and entitlements. Minister Porter goes on to continue to say it is sensible and proportionate. Nevertheless, this IR legislation, which is you know, called the COVID recovery uh, package, which, was really, which is really the guise of uh, will create rhetoric around the creation of new jobs because we will boost company profits by cutting the wages and conditions of Australians. Why are they doing this? They're retreating now because of the sake of political expediency. But we cannot forget, as we've seen time and time again in this place, that this is their real agenda. 
But you can also see uh, in what the government continues to put forward to this place uh, that dropping the boot test is only part of the picture. It's certainly not the only issue. There are uh, issues in relation to uh, the changes of rostering and hours and conversion of pay, etc., um, from casual to permanent, etc., that are also egregiously uh, problematic. And I can say uh, that what does that mean for a nurse like Anne? A nurse like Anne, who's been a registered nurse for 12 years, who works in aged care. Well, as, we, as we've seen during the course of this pandemic, we've seen aged care workers told that they can't work two jobs, despite the fact that they don't, don't earn enough hours in their aged care job to get by. We've seen uh, workers have such significant problems in this regard, but these are the kinds of flexibilities that this government wants to continue to impose on, the, um, on Australian workers instead of coming up with funding reform and a package for things like the aged care sector. Uh, as was raised by the nursing and uh, midwifery union, uh, in their submission uh, to the Senate committee, she said, uh, the minister, um, nurses said, the impact of COVID-19 served to draw attention to the risks associated with a casualised, insecure workforce. They highlight health and aged care and movement across work sites uh, in relation to it being an infection risk. But this has been the situation for these workers for too long. COVID has only highlighted that, and we've got to stop this legislation before it Order, passes Senator as Pratt. a whole. Time for the contributions expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Mr. President. And what we saw today was another classic case of the Labor Party spreading lies and fear and pessimism. There is absolutely going to be no cut to the better off test. There never was. What we wanted to do was to enable, enable businesses who were suffering under COVID, Order. who were suffering under COVID, to enable them to survive. To enable them to survive. And if, it, if wages, if wages are going to get cut, Order. if wages Senator are going to be Pratt, cut by silence. any party, it's going to be under the Labor Party. It's going to be under the Labor Party because the Labor Party's policy is to force casuals to take up permanent work. To take up permanent work. Now that's expected to cost $153 a week, and that is typical of the Labor Party because they are all about command and control. Command and control. Don't give the workers a choice as to whether or not they want to stay on casual. Uh, conditions and earn 25 per cent loading. No, 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 no. We're going to tell you what to do and how to do it. And of course, what will that do? That will reduce flexibility. And if you reduce flexibility, you're going to destroy jobs. You're going to destroy jobs. And that's what the Labor Party does. Under this government, under this government, we've created over one and a half million jobs. We've got 80 per cent of the people who lost their jobs under COVID when, with the initial outbreak, we've got them back into work. And if it wasn't for the Labor state premiers shutting their borders and causing lockdowns at the drop of a, a one or two COVID cases, we'd probably have the entire 100 per cent of people uh, back, in, back in. So you know, this is the thing with uh, Labor. And if you go and look at Labor's record, when they brought in the Fair Work Act, okay, when they brought in the Fair Work Act, it was after the Fair Work Act was introduced that wage theft went up because their laws are so complicated that employers and we're not you know this isn't just big business this is the ABC this is Morris Blackburn this is Morris Blackburn you know Senator Watt Senator Green they both work for Morris Blackburn an industrial relations law firm couldn't even pay their staff properly that tells you just how complex fair work was when it was introduced by the Rudd Gillard government 
I mean, it was introduced by the Rudd Gillard government. And let's not forget which party raised penalty uh, rates for retail for the re retail industry. You know which party that was? The Liberal National Party. The Liberal National Party. Saturday rates went up from 140% to 150%, and loading from six o'clock to nine o'clock during weeknights went up from 130%. To 150 per cent, because we know that it's important to reward people when they're working those uh, hard hours. And I know, as a former stay-at-home dad, uh, you know those hours between six and nine o'clock at night are very important. When you've got children, you've got to bath them, feed them, uh, read to them, get them to brush their teeth. And anyone who's been a parent will know how hard that is. Um, and you've got three little guys running around. So make no mistake that under this, under the coalition. Only under the coalition, we will create jobs. And what we are doing with this IR uh, changes is to actually give workers the choice so they can convert from casual to permanent. So they can convert from casual to permanent. And we know Senator Watt, he's been very quiet as the Minister for Resources lately. He's not doing much of a, a very good job there. Um, don't see much of, him, much of him at all. It's a bit like, where's Murray? when it comes to supporting the coal industry and the mining industry. Um, but we will be the party. So we're actually giving, giving workers the right, if they choose, if they choose. We're not going to tell people what to do. We're going to, if they choose, they can go permanent. They can go permanent. And the other, the other change that I think um, I, I is very uh, a good change is the fact that we want to make it 21 days to finalise uh, negotiations. Now, I've got to admit, I've had a lot of jobs over the years. Most of them have been off, off award. When I was a student, I worked under award conditions. I didn't need three weeks to work out my, my pay contract. I mean, it's basically you get a salary, you'll get four weeks' leave, you'll get two weeks' public holidays, you'll get uh, two weeks' sick leave. You know, it, it's, you know, all these awards are in place. Why do you need so long? And of course, it's, it's just a racket for the industrial relations lawyers to make more money, to milk employers, to milk employees, to keep everything as complex as possible so Labor can keep their IR mates in a job uh, and basically destroy industry. Thank you. The question is the motion is moved by. Are you speaking? Sorry, <laughs> Senator O'Neill, my apologies. That's Senator O'Neill. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. President, and I rise to um, make a contribution in the taking note today. Uh, Senator Gallagher, I understand, indicated that we would be responding to questions that were directed to the uh, to Minister Birmingham and to uh, the, the Minister for Defence, but also uh, with regard to industrial relations. I want to associate myself with the comments from Senator Gallagher first up, but I'm here to stand up for Australian workers who are at this particular point of time under great threat by a really dodgy piece, a dodgy piece of work in the shape of an industrial relations bill that the government is pushing before. We know how dodgy it is because uh, today, despite the denials and the, the, the comments there from Senator Rennick, the government have had to drop a big chunk of the bill, the boot test, which was you know, the, the better off overall test, because in fact it became very clear in evidence over the last couple of weeks that what they were pro proposing was going to lead to worse off overall for workers. More insecurity and cuts to wages. That is what this bill was lined up to do. And if it gets through, even with amendment, workers in this country will be absolutely worse off. We can tell today that uh, Minister Birmingham, the, you know, in full flight here in the in the chamber in question time, didn't know what his colleagues were doing on the other side, and he could, uh, the only uh, defence he could mention, uh, he could muster, was to say it's his intention in this legislation. It's the government's intention in this legislation to look after workers. Well, I can tell you what, you cannot trust the intention of this Liberal National Party government. You can never ever trust the intention, and I remind. Uh, Australians who might be listening to this, that the road to hell, in fact, is paved with good intention, and this bill will be hellish in its outcomes for Australian workers. Senator Macdonald made a contribution here this afternoon. She was actually in Queensland, in Townsville, where we went to take evidence. And she asked a question uh, about what was going on with this legislation. She got a response uh, from Mr Bukarika, who was uh, giving evidence about the total impact of the bill. And he did agree that in this omnibus bill, and for those who uh, might be listening who don't understand, it's kind of like you get a great big bag 
and you chuck everything in it that you want, and somewhere at the bottom you bury a tiny, you know, um, smarty-sized little sweetie that you think you can get away with. So one small thing that might be good that you can hang on to, while the rest of it is just totally doing over the Australian workforce. So this is what Mr Bukarika said in response to Senator Macdonald's question. The bill has a range of measures. He was trying to be honest. A union is saying, not all of them bad, but taken as a package, this bill should be rejected. Well, they've jettisoned one bit today. They've jettisoned the boot. There's a lot more they need to get rid of. And the rationale, Mr Bukarika put it very well. I've already stated there's a critical flaw in the bill in the relation to the definition of casual employment. Now, let's be clear. If this government gets its way, if this legislation gets through, you'll be a casual employer if your employer says you're a casual employer. There will be no clear and proper test. It's totally exploitative, totally exploitative of Australian workers. The casual definition, and the only reason that this government's mentioned it at all, is because they want to stand up against workers. They want to construct, through this legislation, cuts to your pay, more insecurity for you in your work. And they have dressed up the most disgraceful little uh, piece of response to concern about people who want to become permanent. Not everybody wants to become permanent. Sometimes it's handy in your life to be a casual. We know that. We support it. But if you want to become permanent, this government's got this little play going on where they say, oh, if you want to become permanent now, we're making it easier for the, the boss to ask you if you want to be permanent. Except they're not letting you know that if the boss changes your shift any time in the last six months over a period of 12 months, that means they do not have to ask you. They do not have to. They've given the whistle to the leader of the. Uh, they've given the whistle to the captain of the opposite team, and they've removed the umpire. That's what they've done. That's how rigged against the workers this government's construction of this legislation is. This omnibus bill that we are fighting tooth and nail against for the Australian small businesses and workers, we will continue to fight day in and day out. The boot's gone. We need to stick the boot into the rest of it and get rid of this disgraceful piece of legislation that is full of government intention, malcontent, malintention for Australian workers. The question is the motions moved by Senator Gallagher and Senator Pratt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. We know the ayes have it. Senator Waters. President, I uh, move to take note of the response to my question to Senator Birmingham um, regarding the, uh, the rape that occurred in Parliament House. Now, I asked about this issue yesterday and I asked uh, whether or not the government would support the Sex Discrimination Commissioner doing a culture review of what on earth is going on in this building uh, where we have incident after incident. I didn't get a reply to that aspect of the question yesterday, but this morning we saw the Prime Minister finally respond. But his response was really the bare minimum. What he's now proposed is two reviews, but they're both internal. There's one internal review that will be led by his own staff uh, member in his department um, that will look at the mishandling, frankly, of uh, Ms Higgins' rape allegations and the fact that she felt silenced and unsupported and let down and has ultimately moved on from politics. Um, and the second review will be led by a Liberal MP into uh, the culture of this building. Now, um, when the fact that you have uh, a silencing effect and previous history of party being put before personal safety, it is not enough. It is not adequate to have internal reviews to deal with this issue. I can tell you now, internal reviews do not give women confidence that these issues will actually be tackled and that anything will change. So that's our first message to the Prime Minister. Um, do an independent external review. It can be the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. Um, they've got a great track record of looking at these issues in other workplaces because, sadly, we know that Parliament House is um, not unusual in having uh, sexual harassment and assault uh, incidents that are sadly rife for many, many workers. So um, the other point that I uh, asked and, and didn't get a response is how do we know if these uh, internal reviews and the findings of same will even be made public? There's a, there's a long history of the PM uh, charging his own people with looking into some scandal or another, usually involving one of his ministers, usually a male minister, I might add, um, and often the results of that re review are simply not made public. There's no transparency 
in that process. And naturally, the conduct doesn't tend to change. So I asked about whether or not the review findings will be made public, and again, sadly, I did not get an answer. We also don't know what time frame will be applied for those reviews. The Prime Minister didn't answer that question in his press conference earlier today. I would hazard a guess not till after the election. Um, we don't know whether or not these internal reviews will interact with existing reviews that are on foot, being led by our um, uh, CPSU, our, the union that covers this building and its workers and the staff in this building. Um, that review uh, is already underway, and they have been been trying to get members of the government to engage. My understanding is they've had no success in so doing, which frankly is unsurprising but is unacceptable. Um, and it's not clear whether or not uh, staff themselves here in this building or the women's safety sector or any other relevant experts will be consulted in the course of those internal reviews. Again, internal reviews are not good enough. They will not restore confidence, uh, and the Prime Minister needs to do better. Perhaps he could ask his wife for some advice in that regard. And on that point, um, the mention in the press conference earlier this morning by the Prime Minister, which I asked Minister Birmingham about, um, really had some uh, very dated undertones to it. Now we know the Prime Minister spent some money receiving uh, from an empathy consultant. Well, my suggestion is that the Prime Minister uh, now seek some training about modern attitudes to gender. Because frankly, there was victim blaming that occurred in his press conference today. Now, he may not have intended it, it may well have been unconscious, but nonetheless, it was there. His statement that um, Brittany Higgins found herself in a vulnerable situation completely denied the fact that she had been put in such a situation by a badly behaved man who happened to be employed by his own party. That victim blaming is sadly so uh, widespread and often unconscious that training clearly is required. Um, the other uh, point was that uh, the Prime Minister was asked to reflect on what if it had been his daughters. Well, it's not the 1950s anymore, Prime Minister. Women have value irrespective of whether we are daughters or wives um, or in, other, in any other way related to men. We have value in and of ourselves. So I was disheartened to hear that very outdated notion expressed by the so-called leader of our nation. Now, Ms Higgins has called for an independent body for staff to take complaints to. The Prime Minister said today he would listen to her. I asked him to listen to that call. We'll see what happens in that regard. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes.